For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? It's my birthday, and I am so excited because today I am celebrating a dear friend who just also celebrated a birthday. I have been trying for years to get her here, and today it's finally happening. Marion Haley Moss, I am such a fan of hers. I love everything that she stands for, uh, and I have to say that she also sent me the greatest vegan carrot cake in the world. We'll talk about that a little later. But before I bring her on, I, I hope she doesn't mind, I pulled a little something off of her page, and I'd like to share it with you. And then we'll meet Marion on the other side. I came from middle, middle America. This was the home I grew up in. This is my mama and dad in 1956. This is my great grandmother who came west in a covered wagon. This is my dog, Yippy. And I'm Marion Haley Moss. My mama would take me to the movies. You know, she'd look up at that big screen and see women thinking and feeling and expressing themselves with no fear about who was watching. And Mama just glowed. Mama had been acting all her life, but to be a recognized actress meant freedom and romance and respect. I'd say that was Mama's version of the American dream. She was dismayed when it became my dream, too. And here she is, Marion Haley Moss. I am so excited that Hi. you are celebrating with me today. Yes, yes. Happy birthday. Thank you. And happy birthday to you, too. I Just uh, last week, you had a birthday to kick off the month. You share a birthday with my brother. So uh, happy birthday to both of you. Is he in show business? Oh, no. I'm the only one that fell off of that tree. Okay. <laughs> But life is show business, don't you think, Marion? Yes, I do. I was just working with an actress friend of mine, Lenore Harris, who was writing up her um, life for a grant. <clears throat> and she said her uh, she felt that acting was uh, natural to life, but being a performer, you had to learn some technique. And I, I think that's very true. Well, we're going to talk about the work that you're doing today in a few minutes. But before we get there, I want to go back a little bit. Um, we saw these great pictures. I had asked for a photograph of you at five years of age, but then we see them here. Um, I know you that asked you, for me at five. I didn't hear that. Well, uh, well, it's okay. I got them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you. I know that you were you were born in Portland, Oregon, if I'm not mistaken, and Growing up, and I love the fact that you said that your mom was an actress, as I said, all of life is acting. Right. But did she pursue a career as an actress or no, not? No, not at all. Not at all. She was, uh, you know, a, a good wife and a mother. But that's how I knew that um, acting was very important. She used to take me to the movies as my grandmother, and I think it was, I don't think it was a snake pit, but I think it was a movie called Johnny Belinda. Yes. And I looked Jane up- Jane Wyman, Academy Award winner. Yes, Jane Wyman. Yeah. Um, was it Jane Wyman? Jane Wyman, yes. Yeah. Well, I don't remember it at all, but I remember looking up at my mother and there was a countenance on her face that 
I had never seen before. You know, it was like a wisdom countenance. Mm -hmm. And I felt that uh, my mother, there was much more to my mother than was um, taken place in the home, you know. And I felt also that uh, the movies and acting was a very powerful tool in uh, addressing people. Well, today is, believe it or not, it's World Global Movie Day. And uh, <laughs> movies, of course, have an impact on all of us. I, you know, am often asked how it all began for me. I am a product of 1960s and 70s television. I grew up watching, seeing you on Love American Style. I still remember your performance on that. Uh, and our dear friend, Barbara Minkus, who is watching, who is a dear friend of yours. Uh but it was another actress uh, who brought us together, and that's our dear friend Peggy Pope. Yes. And when I think of how lucky I have been to know some of the people that I used to sit in my living room and watch on TV, um, I knew that that was the world that I wanted to be a part of. When did the light bulb go off for you when you decided this is the path I want to be on? It wasn't a light bulb, it was a safety raft. I had this, it, you could, I'm sure you've read the book, but I had this very unusual experience when I was 11 years old, it's very young. Mm -hmm. I was walking in the, the junior high hall and I had my glasses and I always was a quiet person, my glasses on and I felt, you know, ordinary and this, very handsome, I never had seen him before, student, walked by and I thought, oh my, you know, <laughs> and uh, he whistled. And it was very strange. I think um, it was a narcissistic attack because I had, I felt it wasn't sexual, but I had this power all of a sudden that somebody recognized another part of me. And um, so, of course, I was smitten. But unfortunately, uh, he was a bad boy. And uh, he was caught uh, stealing cars and hubcaps and not hubcaps, wheels. So he was soon sent to, um, what was it, military school mm -hmm. to tighten him up. But it didn't work. And my parents, um, they forbade me to see him. So I was... A good girl, I obeyed them, thank God. And uh, I just sublimated, you know? So I, at the time I was taking uh, dancing, and so I kind of upped the scale with my partner, Eric Daggy. We danced uh, these uh, formal dances around uh, Seattle. There were a lot of, uh, what do you call it, army mm -hmm. things. So you perform there. And I performed at school and then I had this wonderful drama teacher, um, Paulette, forgot his name. I don't talk about acting very much. Um, anyway, he was, he was fabulous. And uh, from then on, you know, and um, in my senior year, I was cast in uh, the lead in uh, Smiling Through. Mm -hmm. And it was my story, I felt. So it was just natural. And I just went on from there. Now, you know, a lot of kids, I, I did school plays and did all of that as well. Uh -huh. And then I did local theater companies and everything. A lot of kids do it, but a lot of, uh, but a lot of kids don't pursue it as a career. I always say it's something that pulls at us. Um, what was the pull for you? Uh, that pulled you in this direction of going into the business? It was this power I felt. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. I feel I it every time I step in front of a camera or on stage. Really? Yeah. I got a sense of that today because I haven't done any show business in a long time. In fact, the uh, the makeup just came at 12 o'clock. So. <laughs> Well, you look wonderful. I, you, you just look incredible. Um, oh. What was that? I mean, uh, it was that power. You you went to college, you got a degree, and but how did you move? During the time, you know, uh, 
the University of Washington was like, um, what do you call it, summer stock. Mm -hmm. You would uh, do a play for six weeks every night and be rehearsing one and going to school at the same time. Now it's different. It's much more theoretically oriented. And you have to be now a master's student to even perform. That's what I hear. I haven't been back. So. But there, there's a, a crossroad in every entertainer or performer's life where they can go East Coast, West Coast. For you, <laughs> what, I mean, how did you make that decision? Or was well, that decision it was made, for you? made for me? You know, I yes. went down after uh, the University of Washington. I went down to San Francisco and uh, I acted in uh, the actor's workshop there. And I would have stayed there. But my father <laughs> said, uh, and, oh, I want to talk to you about Richard Stern, too. Because, yes. you know, um, from the uh, actor's workshop, I, I uh, performed two summers in Ashland, and that's where I met Richard. But anyway, um, my father said, you have to earn some money. In this business? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they thought that uh, it was a fantastic, you know, an unusual thing to graduate college, much less. Uh, so if you graduate college, you're supposed to earn a lot of money. So anyway, um, I auditioned then. There was the Fox Theater near Chinatown, near um, the Purple Onion. Have you heard of that? Wow, yes. Yeah. So um, I auditioned for Under the Yum Yum Tree. And uh, at that time, I... Uh, I didn't want to, I, I wanted to stay with the workshop. So I got a friend of mine to do the lead, but I was friends with Marianne Walters, who actually jump-started my career. And um, so I went back to the workshop, but then my father kept saying, you know, but most of these kids in the workshop, that that's, was my drawback. I didn't have stamina. Most of these kids had a job in the daytime. I couldn't do that, energy-wise. Mm -hmm. So I had, to, <laughs> I had to follow my father. Um, so anyway, uh, they put on, uh, the Little Fox Theater put on um, Private Lives. Yes. And Mar Marianne was the lead, and I was the young girl in there. And... Uh, the same people who did Private Lives took Under the Yum Yum Tree to New York and took me with them. So that's how I came to New York. Otherwise, I would have stayed with the Actors Workshop. I love Herbert Blau, and I just loved working there, you know, because it was a meaning, meaningful place. But they came, oh, go ahead. They came, Sorry. they came to New York. A couple of years later, anyway. So, uh, it was, was it an easy transition for you to make? Uh, New York was a very different uh, ball of wax. Was, oh. it an easy, was it an easy transition for you? No, no. I don't think. I don't. It was so easy being, you know, a kid in drama school, and it was pretty easy being because. There was such opportunity at the Actors Workshop and such ground, grassroots uh, dedication. Everybody was so dedicated. And it kind of was just like a drama school, but coming to New York was a whole different thing. Marion, I, I want to ask you, with the work that you've done in the theater, um, who do you consider mm -hmm. your mentors, the ones that you really learned either professional or life lessons from? Well, I learned most of my lessons by my mistakes. That's why. Um, Me too. <laughs> I think uh, Mary Ann Walters actually, and uh, that's another, well, that's another thing. I don't think I ever was grateful enough to her. She really, she introduced me to Milton Goldman and he was one of the top, if not the top, agents at the time. And he really, uh, he and Janie Oliver, uh, 
Janie liked my kind of work and mm -hmm. uh, those those two people. Uh, but what was the question? But I, I want to go back to something you just said, that you feel that you learned a lot of your life lessons from mistakes. Looking back, do you really consider them mistakes or life lessons? Well, I feel to me they're life lessons, but I feel they're also mistakes because I uh, I should have been so much more grateful to the people that I met along the way. And in um, that's why I was thinking in coming on this uh, program with you, I started thinking about it and they're, they're all so precious. And- um, Well, no man's an island, especially in this business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's kind of the way I was an island, you know, I'm going to do it, that kind of thing. Well, I mean, you've had the opportunity. I want to talk, first of all, uh, I'm going to mention a couple of people um, because people that matter to me that uh, I'm grateful for, I mean, getting the chance for, to know Peggy Pope, for example, and meeting you when you came to our interview. Thank you for that. And we've been in touch ever since. So thank you for that too. Um, but Peggy was such a life force to me. Um, what are some of the lessons that, or things that you learned, you worked with her in Harvey uh, with, uh, you know, with uh, Helen Hayes uh, and uh, with Jimmy Stewart? Uh, that was a heady experience. It had to have been. Yes, it was. Peggy was a very good supportive friend throughout the show and onward. She was, and <laughs> Peggy was one of these people, that, you know, you say, well, Peggy, do you know of a heart doctor? Or do you know of a masseuse? Or, I mean, she had a list. She's been through it all in the city. She knew the top of everything, you know, uh, but she was a very supportive person and very talented. Uh, and the funny thing about, uh, I would go down be, uh, downstage before the curtain opened and I said, to Peggy was down there too, I said, well, what's that rustling? You know, I hear something. Oh, that's Jimmy. Jimmy would go, he would sense the audience before he went on, he would go all <laughs> around the set. I mean, it was so funny. Oh, that's amazing. He That's was, amazing. and he was very dear. <laughs> he was so good. Um, and uh, Helen Hayes, you know, at the, I was very nervous. She in, invited the people that she was um, working with in scenes. She invited them for a hamburger or lunch or something. I could barely swallow it, but uh, she, uh, she was fantastic. She would be talking, you know, oh, and my tulips and everything. I'm growing that. She'd then just walk on, you know. But I, I saw her one time be nervous, and that was the night before we opened, you know. And she had one cigarette. She said, and to steady herself, she said, oh, we're so lucky, you know. And this is a woman that, you know, from me I to a pup has been and she was fantastic so, oh, and okay. all, you know who directed that show jimmy no jesse white jesse white wow yes well i mean he was he had a part but he was telling stephen stephen the director he stephen i love stephen he was um I can't remember his last name, but anyway, he would say, sit there. He said, "Go there," and Jesse would say, "No, no, no. We did it this way because Jesse was in the first Broadway production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So actually, you know, Jesse would uh, would have the last word. It was very funny, and Stephen was so so patient. Well, Mary, eventually you went on to do television and film. Was that an easy okay. transition for you? Yes, because. Uh, the uh, film I did, I didn't do that much film, but uh, Lovers and Other Strangers. Lovers and Other Strangers. 
that was me, you know. It wasn't, it, it, but I, I was kind of, uh, before anything I did, whether it was stage, TV, or even a commercial, I would do warm-ups with the body, warm-up with the voice, and then I would like, you, my, I didn't know about meditation then, and then I would just, you know, I mean, it was all this prep, no matter what. So, no, it wasn't. Well, I want to talk about the second phase of your okay, life. And, if, go ahead. You know, you said coming to New York. Coming to New York, the first month, maybe, it was like a wonderland. I, my mother... I don't know how she knew. She said, stay at the Edison Hotel. Uh. So I immediately, because my boyfriend at the time in San Francisco was Francis Sullivan. Sullivan. He was the theater doctor. He said, call my friend Clive Revel and, uh, you know, see if you can get together. So I called Clive Revel and I invited myself. Because I was so, you know, here I am. <laughs> so, I called Clive Revel. He said, well, you must come up and see me. So I said, how about tonight? So he took me up there. We had chicken. That was before I was vegan. He had a picnic on his floor. It was on um, Central Park West. And then he showed me a picture of him and um, I can't remember, some very famous uh, woman dancer, uh, Julian. Uh, I don't know touring the Grand Canyon. So that was my first night in New York. Wow. And we on, we were on 46th Street, I think, yeah, in this little theater <clears throat> down below the Mayfair Hotel. And it was the Mayfair Theater. Mm -hmm. And on the other corner was uh, Richard Burton and uh, in Hamlet. <laughs> I, I was just dying. So my friend, my Romeo, my Romeo was carrying a spear. I mean, this is like New York, right? <laughs> and that's oh. the way to do it. That's great. Yeah. Uh, he was so Marianne, I want to ask. He, um, also, he also carried a uh, microphone. No, uh, what do you call it? A thing that, that uh, you know, you record mm -hmm. The recording machine. Oh, the recording, okay. And he recorded subterraneously uh, John Gilgood with Richard Burton talking, you know. And so his he came out with a book and William Redford came out with a book and it's always been uh, conflicting. But uh, Richard's book and uh, Redford's book are being used for this spring, a uh, play in the Royal Theater called, uh, it's about Burton and Hamlet, uh, Burton and uh, Gilbert. It's called what, something in Q, you know. Wow, what a, uh, and that's coming out this spring? Yeah. Wow. Uh, Marion, you are such a great writer. Um, oh, when, oh, really? No, will you, no, just say thank you. Uh, it's true. <laughs> Uh, when did the writing start for you? And we're going to talk a little in a moment about the work that you're doing now and the last few years. But when did you start to write? This and isn't like when I started to act. It's like this feeling of bursting. You just have to do something with it. And uh, I wasn't acting anymore. And I can't like, you know, with clients. So I, I just had to write because... The doctor told me to, I should come to Los Gatos when my father was uh, passing away, terminal with, uh, he told me it was terminal, with lung cancer. So I uh, went and stayed there for three years because my mom, I was going to take my mother back, but she was too frail. So I stayed there and um, it was just an in I was just so great, grateful. Now, you made a comment a few moments ago that I want to go back to. You said that you felt like when you were first arriving in New York and were having a career, 
that you were an island, but I, you are a humanitarian. When did you step off of that island and start becoming aware of everything around you? I mean, you are a vegan. You uh, uh, are really out there for uh, our environment, for our children. When did the humanitarianism come about? When, I, when, when this island hit bottom, you know, uh, my second divorce was very, very tough. And um, not because of him, because of me. And um, so a friend of mine, uh, I don't think I would have ever paid attention had I not been down in the, in the cellar, <laughs> the cellar cellar. So. Uh, well, Marion, a lot of people end up in the cellar, but very few people come out of the cellar. How did you get out of the cellar? Funny. <laughs> well, a friend of mine invited me over to her home one night uh, with another friend, and she said, I want you to see a, a video of uh, the master that I'm following, a spiritual master, a Supreme Master Shing Hai. And uh, she served with her friend a vegetarian dinner, and there were about 10 of us. And I saw this uh, spiritual uh, master speaking to the uh, group at um, the UN. And I thought, well, I'll get, well, what else is there, right? <laughs> I'll give that a shot. So, uh, but it, it was very touching. So, in order to do the meditation, uh, you had to be vegetarian at the time uh, for, I think, two weeks out of the month. So it was, I don't know, practice vegetarian. So I said to my friend, I said, w will it be any different? Will being vegetarian different change? She said, we'll try it and see. <laughs> and so uh, I did and it, it just seemed to work and go in the right way. So then was I that an easy was that an easy but a lot of people may think about it. A lot of people don't actually go there. Was it an easy transition for you to become a well, vegetarian? Day, you know a lot of people have lives that are humming along and why why, you know, worry themselves. But I was in the cellar. So I would try any, but it was easy. It, I did it overnight. It was not such a big thing, but I don't know if people, I think people have the wrong script also. They say that they have to eat, you know, animal protein in order to be, and um, I, that's not true. But anyway, uh, I think no, it was, it was, I think it was more difficult being vegan. She had this, uh, during meditation, she had this uh, image of what was to come about climate change. So then uh, all of us in the meditation, it's all over the world, um, had to be vegan. And uh, that was harder, not because but it's harder when you go to restaurants and things at the time. Now it's easy because there's a lot of vegans. Mm -hmm. She even started, you know, uh, vegan restaurants all over the world. And she has a 24-hour uh, 7 uh, television on uh, the computer, Supreme Master Television, showing you it's getting more and more. She was very gracious and... Uh, polite and kind at the beginning, but she wants people to be uh, vegan faster. So she started to show graphic stuff, which is pretty bad. Yes, um, and, and I watched a few of the videos that you sent me as well. It's uh, it's uh, rather shocking. How long ago was that, uh, that, the, uh, that you made the transition? First of all, uh, uh, being a vegetarian. I met her before. I went to Los Gatos to see my folks. In fact, I was, uh, I saw, I was initiated in August. I met uh, her in July, uh, June, 
and then I went in October. To my, I don't think I could have helped my folks the way I did had I not known about the meditation. Wow. So, when did you uh, begin to feel the difference in your body, uh, you know, uh, with that transition? A lot of people get thinner. I didn't. But I feel light. It was like I have air. All it feel, even though I'm not, I'm kind of pudgy. But it's all light. I mean, I don't mean visual light. I mean feather light. No well, I want to show. I'm going to show another little uh, quick video that I've got here. It's very quick, and then because this is going to show people a little bit about the work that you're doing now, and then I want to talk about how this all began for you. So here it is, this very quick video. Uh, so let me make sure that I'm pulling up the right button here, uh, and here, uh, here we are. I have a couple of those books on my shelf. So, and thanks to you. Um, but how did the writing begin for you as, uh, as far as, uh, they're not just children's books. I mean, they are great books to, you know, for anyone. Uh, when did it all start for you? Well, as I said, when I came back from Los Gatos, I just had to write about my folks. And then I started writing about the people I love. And that was my, uh, that I think that was my first book, my autobiography. Mm -hmm. Then I got uh, breast cancer and I wrote about that. And then I started writing about the animals. Oh, thank goodness I have this fantastic, I mean, she must have, or God must have sent Mark Chauvin, Chauvin. He's a French illustrator and he makes, he could make the, the uh, alphabet sing he's just wonderful and he's so he's just he uh, so i keep going <laughs> he's very inspiring you know how many books have there been all together around 20. wow and, and i put a lot of them into one uh, compile them into uh but they're short i uh, compiled them into the one Astor court stories mm -hmm. The longest one was the first one, Randall, a dog named Randall, which was from a true story of a child that was thrown away on Randall's Island, and I made him uh, vegan. Hmm. And you know who allowed, who helped make it for kids was uh, Mark uh, Wilk. Ah, oh, <laughs> yes. Marilyn Michaels' son. Yes, 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 yes. I love Mark. I haven't seen him since before COVID. Uh, but uh, do you see him often? I don't see anybody in COVID. Yeah. But, uh, um, I used to see him often. I haven't seen him for a while, unfortunately. He's so talented. So oh, my God, is he? Oh. Well, the apple doesn't been... fall far from the tree in that family. Yes, yes. So, uh, Marion, what is your process? Uh, I mean, are, is your mind constantly filled with these images of these animals that you bring to life? Or is it easy for you? Is it, do you have certain hours? A lot of questions that are there, I know. Uh, but what is your process? Most of the process is uh, taken from real life. Like Randall was real, it was a story. And the uh, story I put on, what was it, uh, Wednesday, uh, MailChimp, uh, Peepers, that was from real, right? Most of them are real stories that I see, except for The Brave Tree that I wrote with my friend, <laughs> Renata Holt. You see, these people that I get to help, that 
that is uh, made up, but I was so upset at the uh, fires in Cal. I come from mm. the West Coast, and I'm yes. so Now this year, there's floods, but we haven't written a book about the flood. Then there's the uh, uh, Mother of Nature Secret. That was made up. Chris Stover, who used to be a, uh, used to work at Amazon. He uh, helped write that. Most of these people that I get are more poetic. I, I write the main thing and then they blossom it. You know, he was so poetic and so is Renata. Really. Now, when you made that move to go from writing your autobiography, you wrote about breast cancer, and now you're writing these incredible, uh, I call them life lessons, because there's a lot of lessons within this. Uh, so what do you hope, for the most part, that people will get when they read your books? Well, I hope that they'll become, uh, their hearts will open a little more to the animal people, and that maybe they might think about changing their diet to vegan. But the uh, sure thing is that they can't help but open their hearts to the animal people. You know. Well, I'm definitely an animal person, and I know that you are too. You still have your three cats? No. Is Benny there? Uh, I can get Benny. Danny, bring uh -huh. Benny on. I'll bring Benny on so everybody can see Benny. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you you want to see? This is, uh, can you see him? This is. Oops. <laughs> oh my God! It looks like my shadow. I have a, a cat named Shadow that looks exactly oh. like that. Here's Benny. Oh, look at that! Yeah. He's so adorable. yes, <laughs> thanks for asking for him. Uh, you know, not... everyone loves Benny. Oh. He's, he's got one... quite a personality. Yes. This one is. Uh, I don't know if I think it's Adi. Adi and Eddie, they're all rescues. My, I had to put one down the uh, peaky the, this uh, summer. Well, it is the hardest thing in the world. Uh, I, we've been through that on more than one occasion. Uh, I can't imagine my life without animals. Um, uh, have you always been an animal person? And coming to New York, how long did you live here before you got your first pet? Well, I tell you, it was, uh, the first year I got married and had uh, my husband, John Thackeray, who's a writer, mm -hmm. he uh, got uh, us a uh, wire hair dog soon called Ibu. He, uh, what was he, uh, oh, he's going to be called Ibo, like the African tribe. Mm-hmm. But he couldn't understand no from Ebo. So we had to call him Ebu, which is like a uh, owl. And uh, I had him for, uh, he lasted on into my second husband. And uh, we had to put him down. So it was just, uh, I, I think it's kind of funny because thinking about my, my experience as a performer, the first year, I was had a lead in a Broadway show called The Mating Dance. Mm -hmm. It closed after the first night. The second year, I had the lead in a Broadway show called, what was it? Uh, keep, no, um, Best Kept, best Laid Plans. That closed in three nights. And so from then on, I was always cast as a supporting character. I never had a lead again. <laughs> I think it's very funny. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, we all, I, you know, I just saw a great documentary uh, that earlier this week that I recommend to everybody called Facing the Laughter about Minnie Pearl. And Minnie Pearl, believe it or not, uh, thought that she was going to be a Shakespearean actress, uh, which may surprise a lot of people knowing her the way we know her. Her real name is Sarah Cannon. Uh, but uh, life has other lessons for us. And I think that if we can be open to those life lessons and go with it, our lives will be a lot easier. You know, 
I, I'm writing a, a new show now. And, yeah. I, and I talk in the show about the fact that I came to New York expecting a completely different career from the one that I had. So just be open to the possibilities that come your way. Um, are you currently writing uh, a new book? No, no. I'm going to give it a, a rest for a while. But you're... No. you're when I read your books, and I think, and there's certain things that you, your books have come out of situations in the news or that we read about. Um, I have to ask you: Have you been following uh, the saga of the Central Park Zoo owl? No, no, I haven't. Well, someone broke into the uh, uh, the enclosure at the Central Park Zoo and let the owl out. Oh. And the owl, but the, thank God the owl is still alive, and the owl is, sits in the tree, is looking over Central Park, and they're trying to uh, get the owl back. I don't know at this point if anyone, um, you know, Pam Stubbs wrote a wonderful comment. She said, "You're a leading lady to all of us." Oh, so thank you. I thought she was talking about the owl. No, you, you. So oh. the owl, um, oh, thank you know, you. but. Uh, look it up. I mean, if you Google Central Park Owl, you're going to find footage of this owl. Beautiful, regal owl. But someone, unfortunately, broke into the enclosure and let it out for whatever reasons. People have these um, strange ideas that they think they're doing good by letting it free. But the poor thing doesn't know how to survive. That's they right. You know. So I'm sure the Wild Bird Fund is really going after, you know, trying to catch it. And earlier, just a few months ago, and I had no idea about this, but just before COVID, there were these peacocks that were on the property of Columbia University. And they just took them and they've taken them to um, a, a wildlife sanctuary. So they're going to have a wonderful life uh, beyond this because, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize animals are animals are animals. No, way, no other way about it but you take them out of their environment, they don't necessarily know how to survive. Well, the church there, St. John the Divine, used to have peacocks. That's what, that's what I meant, St. John the Divine. Oh, oh. It wasn't Columbia University. It was St. John the Divine. Yes. Did you ever see them? Oh, yes. Somebody uh, just wrote on Facebook the diet of a peacock. It's really quite, quite severe. You know, they can eat snakes and poisonous snakes and digested i mean they're really as an appetizer <laughs> <laughs> you know have you ever heard the sound that a peacock makes i don't think so i was away i'm not going to make it everyone so you just have to google it and look it up but i was away at a, a summer camp years ago and there was a peacock that lived well it roosted on top of the cabin that i was in and every morning uh -huh. uh, I grew up at a farm, so I know what a rooster sounds like first thing in the morning. But the sound that the peacock makes, if it doesn't get you out of bed, nothing will. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so, Marion, one of the things that I like to do as a, round, uh, as a wrap up on my shows is oh, I have some tunnel, questions. Betty. Oh, I thought, how in the world am I going to talk for an hour and it just has flown by? It's good. Well, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, if anyone that's watching has any questions based on anything that we talked about today, by all means, put your questions and I will uh, bring them on and ask Marion. But I've got some questions. Um, I always have two random questions. So pick a number, one or two. It's a surprise question. I don't even know what it is. So, two. And okay, this is the card. What's something that you will never, ever do again? I think I may do the answer. Have sex. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Marion, I had... <laughs> That's not what I was expecting. <laughs> oh, you were expecting I wasn't going to eat me. That's exactly where I thought you would go. <laughs> oh, you, well, you made my day. Oh, my God, that's wonderful. So, you know, when I talk about this as well, you know, my friend Howard Tucker, uh, who called earlier today, I want to, first of all, thank everybody 
for your phone calls today, your cards. Uh, Danielle, your card arrived today in the mail, so Danielle's watching. So thank you all. And Marion, thank you for the vegan carrot cake. It was um, incredible. Uh, we're still enjoying it. So it's great. But each day I pull something out of this calendar. And today it says, call a family member just to say, I love you. Um, are any of your family still around? Relatives, my, anyone? My cousins. Uh, oh, I have a cousin in Oregon and I have oodles of cousins in St. Louis, in Missouri and Kansas. Mm. And do you get a chance to speak with them often? I know that you're, you know, a little keeping... bit. I, I spoke to my cousin Glenda last week in uh, Missouri and I email my cousin Vicki in Oregon uh, every week. So if any of them are watching, thank you for being here. Um, so my next question, and based on the uh, quest, uh, answer you just gave me, anything goes. So <laughs> we've opened the floodgates, everyone. This question is, if you had the power to change one thing about your current life, what would you change and why? My current life? Oh, well, I tell you, I get another apartment. This apartment, <clears throat> I had to move to uh, Philadelphia for six months because my dear neighbors, who I love dearly, and uh, they renovated and I couldn't breathe here. Then another neighbor, there's only three of us on the floor, just uh, is, is getting his apartment ready to sell. And there, I'm sure it's oil paint. So, uh, I had to raise all the windows and I have the air purifier on. I go down. That's one thing I thought of you. You know, you say celebrate. I said, I have to celebrate this situation because I have a garden. And in the garden, I can meditate and breathe fresh air. So that's what this situation uh, told me. But I would definitely get, get another apartment. You know, there's a, a great book called The Walking Path, um, and it's by Julia Cameron, who wrote The Artist oh, Way. I love Julia Cameron. I, I, I am such a, I, I follow her. Every time she's got a book that comes out, I buy it. But The Walking Path, it talks about how to embrace or try to embrace these things that annoy us. Like leaf, the big annoyance for me where I live are the leaf blowers, constantly going in the summer and in the fall. Um, it drives me crazy, but she says, try to find something about the situation that you can celebrate. So thank you for mentioning that. It's true. Um, so you said that you're currently not writing a book. What was, what's the, the most recent book that you've written? Yeah, it's The Bravest Tree. <laughs> and uh, the light, I mean, this came about because of the fires in California. Yeah. Um, but are, is that all part of this story as well? Part of what story? Is uh, The Bravest Tree, the fires? Yes, yes. I'll show you. Uh, Mark Chalvin is just, uh, he's just so, this is where the little protagonist and her dog echo see the tree. Wow, gorgeous photographs. Wow. Wow. Um, Marion, what do you feel uh, in your career was the biggest obstacle that you had to face as an actress? And what got you through that? Well, I think two things. If I come back here the second time, I'd like to have some hair. You know, I, <laughs> I've had to put on, you know, in Lovers and Other Strangers and in Juliet, and I had to wear this long fall, and I just never knew what to do with my hair. And then hair, and uh, like Madeline Kahn, oh my God, we were doing Harvey in Canada. We were filming it there. She had this fantastic hair. Oh, I was so jealous. So I asked for some hair. Okay. <laughs> and uh, the voice. Now, when I hear my voice, I say, oh, my God, is that me? But I've asked a friend in uh, Susan Learman, and uh, she's known me since I was eight years old in Seattle. I said, can I sound like this? She said, yes, always. 
I never knew my voice was strange. It is strange. But and, no, well, it, it may be strange to you, but I mean, it's unique to who you are. I mean, well, I was friends with Carol Channing. Now that was a, an interesting oh. voice. <laughs> and exactly. she, you know, when she wasn't on camera, just being in private moments with her, um, her voice was deeper. I mean, when she would talk to me, it was like a deep voice. You know, yeah. but uh, when she was on camera or anything, her voice would go up like an octave or something. But I would change my uh, following because so many people told me to change it, to make it, you know, straighter. To, I tell myself and any young person getting into to just keep your, you know, keep it. Because yes. a, lot of, a lot of people are going to like it. A lot of people are going to hate it. But you can't please them all. And just go with it. You know, I did reading like this. and it, it, It's not me. It's not you. And we love you as you are. Um, this other thing from this calendar, it says, write down a short story of a favorite memory from your childhood. And I always like to go back to the five-year-old self. Because to me, the five-year-old self is the purest self. It's before life begins to tell you who you should be or who you shouldn't be. Do you have a favorite memory? of when around the time that you were five years old that you could share with us right now? Well, you know, one of those memories, but I was seven, as I told you, that was the biggest memory, seeing my mother in, uh, uh, in what was it? Uh, uh, Johnny Belinda. Y yes, Johnny Belinda. But uh, maybe going to uh, acting class, I was four. My mother put me... Uh, you know, she went to some kind of intellectual uh, study in a, probably in a church there in, in uh, downtown Portland. And then she put me downstairs where they kept the kids and uh, we did drama class. So being with my mother <clears throat> who was prepping me to be Tiny Tim, she would read it, uh, the book, and we couldn't find anything Tiny Tim said, except God bless us all. Yes. So I ended up limping and saying God bless us all for acting class and got the best award. Good for <laughs> you. Good for you. Um, I know, I mean, you mentioned your garden uh, outside your apartment. Yes. Um, this next question was, and I asked this question yesterday, and I love this question. When was the last time that you saw a beautiful sunset and really enjoyed it? Oh, I can't remember any sunset, but today, no, yesterday, I said, oh, because the air is so fresh in the garden compared to up where I am now. So it was so, and I walked, I said, oh, there's the sun. And I sat in the sun and that was so wonderful. And I remembered my grandmother in uh, Grandma French in Portland, Oregon, she would take a, a, a stem of a bush or something and say, oh, look at the beautiful buds. And they didn't, I don't know what she was looking at at the time. And now I understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope you get a chance to get out today because <laughs> you go for a little walk because it is such a beautiful day outside. I go for a walk every morning, first thing. And when I was on my walk this morning, I was just, everything was so beautiful. I mean, it, it, it's quiet where I live. So I just go for this little walk into town and back. And uh, and I do that every morning. And it is just, for me, it's a meditation uh, just to get out and do that little walk. And Yeah, it's good to be with nature. Mm -hmm. I was going to try to do it outside, but I, I didn't want to risk it. Uh, and, you know, the next question, and maybe we know the answer to this, maybe we don't. <laughs> when was the last time that you accomplished a personal goal or dream that you were very proud of and you said, wow, I did that? Well, the probably the bravest tree, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> it's, each book, I feel like that. Wow, that's great. Um, well, you know, and this is a question that I have asked on a few shows because I pulled this and it's important. And I'm going to read the statement and then let you run with it. It says, identify a special needs person in your life 
that has made an impact on your life. Um, because our special needs friends sometimes are relegated to being in the second, third, fourth, fifth row. And I like to put them up front. So if there's a special needs person in your life currently or in the past that you would like to acknowledge uh, that has made an impact on your life. Oh, gosh. Oh, well, I guess it depends on what you term special needs. Uh, someone with a disability. Uh, one of my b very best friends uh, was Peggy Eason, who was born blind. And oh she was, my God. Yeah, but she was such an inspiration to me. And she never considered herself handicapped. She got around better than you and I together, Marion. She lived her life to the fullest, to the very last moment. So that would be the person for me that I would acknowledge. Who would that person be for you? Oh, gee, you know, I don't know of anybody. I uh, read, you know, what's the uh, girl, the girls, uh, the woman um, that was blind, deaf, and... Helen Keller. Helen Keller, but I didn't know her. But mm -hmm. I thought, my God, if she can carry on, you know, so can I. Yes, absolutely. Um but, I'm sorry, now, I wish I, did, I could tell you someone I knew personally. Okay, now this question is one of my favorite questions. Um, what are some signs? That you, questions. <laughs> what are some signs that you are significantly more intelligent than most people? What were the signs? What are some signs that you are significantly more intelligent than most people? I haven't got that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for that sign. <laughs> uh, Marion, um, I mean, obviously, I mean, here we are. We're on social media and everything. Are you a social media person? Yes, I am. Okay. What is your favorite platform and why? How do you get the word out about your books? Well, I gave up on uh, Elon Musk or Elon Musk. So I, I did too. I did too. I it exited Twitter right up front. I did too. You and me both. And so, I'm on Facebook only one day a month. You are? Yeah, I left Facebook. Why? Well, to be honest with you, I think that we are all in danger of becoming items in someone's newsfeed. And I want more than that. And uh, leaving Facebook, I will tell you this, I get more phone calls than I did, ever did when I was on Facebook. People reach out because people, uh, and a lot of people have said, I miss the fact that you're there. But I find that a lot of people are finding other ways of communication. I think that Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, his dream was that all of us would be, by the year 2027, are going to be living in the metaverse. Well, Maybe. I'm not into that. Well, I'm not either. So uh, that that's going to be our most important means of communication. And so I decided to step away from Facebook um, to focus on other things. And I still pop in one day a month so that I can check and see what everyone's doing and, you know, and communicate that way. But uh, for me personally, if it works for you, that's great. But for me, after 14 years, that's how long I was on it on a regular basis. I was on Facebook almost every day for 14 years at some point during the day. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's great. You know, during this uh, paint thing that I have to go in the garden, um, I hardly look at the uh, social media and I say, I think this is better, you know? It's quieter. and uh, But it, you have to do it for uh, telling people about the books and everything. But I'm on Facebook. And it's my favorite because it's the easiest for me to navigate. I cannot for the life of me get uh, um, postings up on um, Instagram. I love Instagram. I uh, It's so funny, some of these. Mm -hmm. I know. Oh, yeah, but I can't post on it uh, easily. So Facebook is it, you know, for now. And Marion, this is my last question for you, believe it or not. And I told you we've got an, uh, and the hour has flown. but. I'd like to know a favorite moment or a memory or a milestone, number one, in your acting career that stands out above all others for you personally. Well, 
Well, finally getting the, there are, are a couple. I was proud of making the horse girl at the uh, actor's workshop. And there I was running around with hardly anything on, but I made her poetic, mm -hmm. you know? That she had a soul, I really, I'm proud of that. And I remember doing my damnedest to get Juliet and Ashlyn. And finally on opening night, I said, look, what am I doing, you know? But uh, that was just for about five seconds and then it was over. But I was scared to death. But I, you know, I called up uh, Bob Loper and went and auditioned and, uh, you know, everything. I really went for that role. But uh, I thought, oh, my God, you know, because Shakespeare, it's not your natural. Mm -hmm. I and what else? Um, well, I'm going to ask the same question uh, for you as a writer. Uh, a favorite moment or a memory or a milestone for you that stands out as a writer? When I was uh, writing about my dad, I just, uh, I just loved him because I felt it too. I, I love to write about um, non-realistic things. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he passed away, him just because he loved the garden so much. I loved him going out through the window to his garden. Mm. Um, I don't know. Uh, and I'm gonna ask the same question again um, for you as, uh, hold on a second, you're picking up on the microphone. Um, so I'm gonna ask the same question uh, as a humanitarian. A favorite moment, milestone, or memory that stands out for you? Well, the uh, little peepers comes to mind real quick. So fragile, so you know, so in need of help, and uh, he has only us to help. Amen, Marion. Don't go anywhere for a moment. I'm going to give my closing comments, and then I'm going to give you the final word today. And it can be about anything that we talked about that you want to expound upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any final message that you want to leave everyone with today. And uh, and don't worry about how to end the show, because when you say goodbye, the show will end. Uh, I will start the credits. So I want to thank everybody for being here today. I want to thank Marion for being here. Uh, I can't think of a better way to spend my birthday than with my friends, either on a virtual or in person but we're all here together. As you all know, I pull a word each day that I focus on each day. And the word that I pulled today was independence. Uh, and a lot of things that Marion said today, you know, are, her, her book is amazing. It's available on amazon.com. Everyone get it and read it and learn more about Marion beyond what we did today. All of her books are available. Uh, you can uh, go to her website. Uh, and MarianHaleyMoss.com. You can get all the information. Uh, I will have all the information on my website as well, uh, on YouTube, so you can follow through. Um, I end every show, I mentioned earlier by asking Marian when was the last time that she reached out to family members. And I was glad to hear that she said that she just spoke with you know, cousins earlier this week. Uh, it's important that we pick up the phone and we call each other uh, just to touch base, to let people know how they matter in our lives uh, because this is it. This is all we have and we need to celebrate each and every day. Pick up the phone, call a friend, not with an email, not with a text message, not a private inbox message. As a dear friend of mine says, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different size boats. And I say, I don't care if you're on a yacht or on a sailboat or a canoe or a kayak or even if you're pushing a tugboat upstream, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that whatever size boat you're on, you have a skipper by your side. Thank you all. 
Marion, I'm turning it over to you. And like I said, don't worry about how to end the show. I will take care of that. You've got the final word. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, it's been so wonderful speaking with Richard. I think he's right on when he says celebrate because there's always something, no matter how hard it is, that you can celebrate. Life is a miracle. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>